So we uh, last time we talked about the early years of modernist movement architecture in America, starting with really once again starting with Frank Lloyd Wright and some of the work he did in California, which helped bring in um, two European architects, Rudolf Schindler and uh, us um, and um, She's the, I'm having a brain freeze here, but um, hopefully you won't have a brain freeze on your quiz. Um, to um, which helped spread the early modernist architecture in Southern California mostly, and then of course the 1932 MoMA ex exhibition, which uh, featured both European modernism and some of those early Southern California projects uh, by Wright and the others um, to. Um, uh, to uh, really popularize the movement. Um, um, now, one of the downsides to that is 1932 is really at the height of the Great Depression. So throughout the 1930s, there really wasn't a lot of construction going on because America was lost in this Great Depression. So um, we're almost going to sort of jump ahead. We talked a little bit. We did jump around a little bit. Uh, we ended last time talking about Frank Lloyd Wright um, and his important works, you know, sort of the second half or maybe even like the third half of his career, um, starting, you know, with Falling Water in 1936 that really helped to relaunch his career um, and made him an, a national sensation. Um, and he worked right up until his death in 1959 on, you know, Huge projects that you know gained a lot of a lot of attention, like Falling Water uh, and um, and the Guggenheim Museum. So um, we're going to kind of pick up with with what's happening elsewhere um, around the same time same time frame. Again, not a lot in the 30s, just because we are um, in the Great Depression. So a lot of this is going to be uh, this lecture is going to be more the post-war. Um, uh, building boom. And this is uh, a, a photo I love. Uh, this is of the TWA terminal by Aero Saranen, which we'll talk about. But it's another one of those historic photos where it looks like a really cool modernist building. And you you see these old cars and it, it looks almost uh, out of place. But uh, that's, that's how modern these were back in, at that time. So we're going to talk about Eliel Salonen, actually, first of all. Uh, we mentioned him before. I don't know if you remember. Um, some of you missed this on the quiz. I think I mentioned about uh, Elio Saarinen's um, competition entry into the Tribune Tower competition from 1922. And he got the second prize. Uh, many architects, and certainly architectural historians, think that his design was the better uh, than the one that won, the Gothic Revival won by Hood and Howells that was um, ultimately constructed, although it's a very beautiful, lovely building. Uh, but the, the, his design was far more um, uh, progressive in its architectural styling and helped to launch the form and such of <clears throat> Art Deco skyscrapers of the 1920s, especially in America, where the skyscraper was a major um, uh, city development. And um, this, he was Finnish, uh, and he had built a pretty substantial career for himself in Finland and um, working mostly in the sort of uh, Art Nouveau style. Uh, I was able to see a lot of his uh, early works there um, when I visited in 2009, and they're really lovely uh, works of architecture there. Um, but, you know, he was, you know, people in America didn't know who he was until this competition. But this gave him enough attention that he was able to immigrate to America in 1932. And he became the director of architecture at the Cranbrook Academy of uh, Art in, out in Bloomfield Hills, uh, uh, outside of Detroit in Michigan, and, and really kind of wound up designing much of the campus. You know, it gave him a steady job because he was the director of architecture there. Um, and again, during the Depression, didn't necessarily always have a lot of architectural work, uh, but it was a lot, afforded him and his family the opportunity to do that. And um, Saarinen is, is an important early um, modernist architect, and he's also representative of that sort of transition. The, he had embraced a lot of the 
modernist ideals that were spreading across Europe, and he's a European architect, but then he moves to uh, the United States and helps to propagate those ideas uh, in the US. And um, just the way Walter Gropius does when he moves and becomes the director of um, Harvard's architecture program and the way we'll be talking about with Mies van der Rohe coming and uh, establishing IIT's architectural program or at least en enhancing that. And I like his quote here, um, and, and we've, we've talked about this as, as certainly as early as the um, arts and crafts movement, which again is, some, is, is an era that he sort of came of age in as an architect, you know, this, the idea of, of designing something in its context, you, a chair in a room, a room in a house, a house in an environment, an environment in a city, and, you know, thinking of of architecture holistically, not just as a one-off, you can just place something anywhere. Um, he, he had a more comprehensive view of architecture than in fact many of the other modernists uh, would have had as we'll see as we move along here. So again, here's that um, entry submission that he did for the Chicago Tribune competition and uh, really became sort of the, the, the hallmark for Art Deco skyscrapers in America. Uh, here's, uh, we're going to talk first about his work at Cranbrook, and again, this is in uh, Broom Bloomfield Hills, Michigan, so um, starts when he becomes the director of design in 1932 and um, ends his career there in 1942. And this little bit, this is uh, a few of the campus buildings, and you can see these are not, you know, these are not the sort of Euro full European international style architecture that we were seeing examples of like you know early works by Corbu. Uh, he was not particularly influenced by Corbusier uh, or even Mies van der Rohe. He, he had his own view of modernism that was rooted you know in uh, sort of the regional work uh, and the, the regional styles of Finland that he brought over. He had more of the Art Nouveau um, training and aesthetic in him than uh, architects like Mies or Gropius or Corbu did. So we see more traditional uh, forms, not heavily decorated. Uh, these are still modern buildings, and we'll see a couple more examples. But but we see you know more traditional brick and tile roofs, you know sloped roofs, not the flat roofs that um, are kind of the hallmark of the international style. So this is a good example to show you that. Um, you know, within this broader movement of modernism, there are a lot of different, you know, genres and styles that you can sort of apply to this. The same way with the arts and crafts movement, you know, there's, you know, green and greens versions, there's the prairie style by right, there's, you know, the Art Nouveau, which is really more of an uh, uh, arts and crafts uh, effect. Here's an aerial view, a uh, historic aerial view of the campus. Uh, you know, this is not a big school, um, still isn't, uh, and it's really a, a, an art, an artist academy. So, teaching, you know, not only they have an architecture program, but they, you know, teaching um, painting and sculpture and other things like that. So, not quite as comprehensive as the Bauhaus, nor as famous, but um, still an important design school. So, here's another building. This is the library and museum that he designed a little later. Uh, and this is a little more modernist here, and I love the contrast with the sculpture by Carl Mies, another a Swedish sculptor who um, came and um, settled at Cranbrook as well. A very, very important um, modernist sculptor uh, that, that's actually one of my favorite. I love his work. Um, but you can see here that now we have a little more of the modernist forms, the sort of uh, rectangular massing, you know, flatter roofs, um, you know, much more devoid of even things like the Roman arches that we saw in some of those buildings in a couple of slides ago. And here's another view of that same uh, kind of arcade there uh, with a um, fountain basin, more sculpture by Mills. Uh, this is a really fabulous, if you ever get a chance to, to go over to Michigan um, uh, towards Detroit, um, go check this out. Um, you can take a tour of the Saarinen's house or his, you know, little townhome uh, where the family lived. Uh, it's settled, you know, it's designed and laid out 
the way he had it with his furnishings and so forth. So that's well worth it. The museum is fabulous. Um, you know, it shows off a lot of the designs that came out of the school here in the 30s and 40s. Uh, this is the entry to the library. And you can see, again, kind of a, a, his own take on modernism. Um, things are pretty stripped down. There's not a lot of ornamentation. There's a little bit of decoration on the doors, these bronze doors, um, uh, and, a, and a sculptural element off to the side. But that's, that's a sculptural element, right? It's not, you know, ornament applied to the building. Um, but even the, the um, inscription uh, or sign, you know, is, is really crafted you know and that, that's that's something that Saarinen had he had a sort of a heavy rich craftsman tradition in him this is a photo of the same pavilion there um, and we see Elio Saarinen standing uh, he's wearing the cool fedora uh, but we also see his son Ero Saarinen uh, would be on his right so kind of almost in the center of the frame um, uh, we'll be talking about his son, Arrow, who becomes even more famous than his father. And then uh, Charles Eames is taking the photograph. Uh, and Charles Eames is one of the, uh, perhaps, one of the most famous um, designers to come out of Cranbrook, uh, he and his wife, Ray. Uh, here's one of the studios. Um, that's Charles Eames kneeling down there. I'm not sure if that's Ray uh, standing there with him or not. Uh, they've definitely met at Cranbrook. Uh, but I'm not sure that that's both Charles and Ray, but it's definitely Charles right here in the center. So here you can see, um, you know, a, a relatively uh, Spartan um, studio space. Again, not ornamented. It's it's um, kept in the relatively modernist tradition here. Uh, one of his most important works, um, besides Cranbrook, is the first Christian church in Columbus, Indiana. I don't know if anybody's been to Columbus, Indiana, not the not the Ohio one. Um, if if you haven't, it's well worth a trip. It's just south, uh, about 45 minutes south of Indianapolis. So it's it's a few hours, three hours or so to get there. Uh, but it is a modern architecture mecca. Um, in starting in the in the 30s, um, the main economic company there, Cummins Engines, the the owner of that um, I guess he was a design you know aficionado and he really wanted to up the quality of architecture in his community and so he made a deal um, in which he said to the community hey look I'll, I'll pay the commissions for the well-known quality architects um, and you know and you know encourage them to do work here here and um, uh, that it, it sort of caught on, and it's really become a big thing where some of the greatest architects in the world, international including, uh, do work in what is essentially a small town or a very small city in the middle of nowhere, <laughs> Indiana, um, not what you would normally expect. Uh, so if you haven't had a chance to go there, um, sometimes trips are organized there or whatever, but um, it's it's really well worth it. It's an incredible place to visit and see some great works of architecture by some of the greatest architects um, throughout the 20th century and even now into the 21st century. So uh, the first and most you know, one of the most important, actually, uh, is the first Christian church uh, from 42. Uh, so this is designed by Elio Saarinen, but his son Aro and Charles Eames uh, worked on some of the interiors as well. So here is a facade view of that. And this is um, more in uh, a more modernist uh, tradition here than some of the buildings at Cranbrook even. Uh, you know, we've got the flat roofs, we've got you know, the very rectangular massing, uh, devoid of ornamentation, all those sort of hallmarks that make a modernist building. Uh, but it's not Corbusian for sure. You know, if you're looking for the five points here, uh, you're not going to see pillow tees and roof gardens and you know ribbon windows here. That's that's not what Saranen was doing. Um, but what I really love about this building is that it's to me it's always reminded me of the cathedral in Florence. If we go all the way back to the first lecture of this semester and remember the Florence Cathedral, um, you know we were mostly focused on the dome by Brunelleschi. But um, the facade and the campanile, the bell tower, this is really the same massing 
as that cathedral, but it's not a copy of this sort of neo-Gothic, neo-Renaissance um, church. It's a modernist version of it, but especially in the way he uh, puts these kind of uh, tiles, marble tiles on the facade here in a more modernist way, mimics that of the church in Florence. Uh, here's another side view of it here uh, with a great sculpture by Henry Moore, uh, an important modernist sculptor. Uh, he always, the Cummins Company also commissioned uh, great works of art and sculpture in the town too. So here's the Florence Cathedral. The baptistry is kind of in the front, but it's got that same kind of form. It's got the tall nave, it's got a side aisle, which is shorter, and then it's got this big campanile or bell tower. And if I go back, you can see the same things. It's got the tall sort of nave form. There's actually a shorter, almost side aisle type element here. And then there's the freestanding campanile here. So, you know, uh, Saarinen being from Europe would have been, you know, very familiar with architectural traditions in Europe. And I think he definitely was thinking about how do we reinterpret the classical forms of these great churches like Florence Cathedral but for the 20th century, or at least the early 20th century or mid 20th century. So um, that's, you know, that's modernism at its best. You know, there's plenty of complaints about um, the really shitty modernist architecture, especially in post-war America. Um, and I'm not going to show you much of that. We're really looking at the good stuff. But, um, you know, this is, this is when you take those kinds of ideas and you and you know and these architects were thinking about how can we represent that zeitgeist i don't know if you remember we talked about the zeitgeist um, early in these modernist uh, lectures the idea of creating an architecture of its time and place and not reflecting upon building something that you know uh, had a structural tradition and an aesthetic tradition that is centuries or even millennia old um, so this is a really good example of how moder a good modernist architect could do that. So here's the floor plan. It's a little bit fuzzy, but um, we see the campanile here sort of in the bottom center uh, and then the main nave of the church space itself. And that shorter side aisle is actually like a side aisle. Um, you can see it's open. There's, you know, columns here that uh, open up the main nave to this side aisle and that provides essentially a, a pathway into the back part. There's another uh, smaller chapel here in the back that uh, Saarinen and Eames worked on especially. And then uh, classrooms and offices and you know support spaces for the church off the side. And it almost creates a little bit of a quadrangle or cloister-like effect as well, which is a um, again, a more traditional European organization for a church. And then here is the interior. This is the, the main uh, sanctuary space, the, the nave. Um, on one side are tall windows that, again, are a modernist reminiscence or interpretation of uh, the, you know, huge Gothic church windows. Uh, these aren't stained glass, but they're um, they have some leaded window to create a certain design pattern in them. Um, and then here are the, the big, these are in case, these are just concrete uh, columns that separate the nave from the aisle over here on the side. Um, you know, no bundled Gothic columns or something like that, just plain concrete columns to reflect the, the current, you know, uh, structural uh, materials and, and construction of that era. This is the smaller chapel off into the back, um, which was uh, more designed and finished out by uh, Aero and Saarinen and um, Charles Eames. And you can see they just used almost common brick here. Um, again, this is the brick that um, architects put on the backsides of buildings uh, where it's not publicly viewed, and they're using that as uh, a finished material on an interior. So that's, you know, that's a big deal. I mean, nowadays it's really cool if you think of like loft spaces and old factory buildings or something. Um, you know, the you know that raw brick wall effect is is really popular and has been 
really going back to the 1970s, but um, this is 1942, and they're doing that um, aesthetic here. So this is pretty forward-thinking design, uh, interior design from that era. And then a really beautiful wood screen uh, behind the altars here that um, uh, was designed and crafted uh, by Eames, who was really into wood, you know, woodwork, as I'll show you in a moment. I just want to show you uh, my favorite building from uh, Columbus, and this is uh, North Christian Church um, by Erosaranen. This is from 1959, finished in 64. Um, it's, I just love this form, and you know, it, it's a nice contrast between what his father did, um, you know, in 1942, and what Erosaranen will do, you know, a little over a decade later. Um, the kind of work that he was doing. So we'll talk more about Arosan then here in a moment. Well, here we are. So his son, Ero, uh, was born in Finland um, uh, and came, you know, to the U.S. with his family uh, in the 30s. And um, his, his mother, uh, Loya, was also uh, very artistic. She was a textile artist. Um, and his sister, I think, uh, also had um, some artistic talent as well. And, and really, Ero Saarinen becomes even more famous and more important than his father. Um, you know, in some ways, uh, Eliel uh, sort of got shortchanged because he comes to America during the height of the Depression. So he had a job. He had the opportunity um, to to live in the U.S. and bring his family here and all that. But um, uh, he he did not have a lot of commissions because of the depression, whereas his son came of age uh, right after the end of World War II and, you know, the huge building boom uh, and the embracing of modernist architecture at that era. Uh, and he becomes one of the most important modernist architects in America. And the only reason we might say he's not the most important is because he dies quite young. He dies in 1961. Um, from a brain tumor. Um, it was very sudden and just one of the great losses. Um, uh, his early death and the early death of John Wellborn Root, Burnham's partner in Chicago, uh, are two some of the most you know, unfortunate uh, losses of architects uh, of the 20th century or late 19th, early 20th century. Um, and Ero um, sort of made uh, name uh, in 1947 with the uh, Gateway Memorial um, Project in St. Louis. This was a design competition to have a monument of some sort honoring westward expansion of America, you know, the Lewis and Clark exhibition. Expo Exhibition, no, exposition <laughs> um, started just uh, just near St. Louis. Um, they struck out into the wild, unknown territories. You know, when uh, after Jeff President Jefferson uh, bought Louisiana territory, uh, which was most of the you know most of the West uh, of what we have in America today, and they you know made it all the way to the Pacific Ocean. They turned around, they came back, and they brought all kinds of knowledge and stuff. And so um, St. Louis um, wanted, to, um, wanted to sort of celebrate that, and there was this big competition for a monument. And uh, ironically, um, his, the, the, uh, the award jury or whoever was managing the award um, got a little confused between the weird spellings of Eliel and Arrow, and a telegram was sent to the family saying, Eliel, you won. <laughs> and the family probably celebrated and said, oh, dad, that's so, uh, we're so happy. Uh, and then like the next day, there was another telegram going, um, we we, we kind of made a mistake, and it, it's actually Arrow that won the competition, and so that had been a little bit awkward. But um, anyway, so it it was Arrow Saarinen's arch, um, that Cantonary arch here, that uh, won the competition, and ironically, it didn't even get built until after his death. Um, uh, it was so forward thinking that they really didn't even have a clue how they were going to make this thing for, um, you know, over and how to fund it for over 15 years. It was, it's a very, very complicated construction. Uh, I won't go into it all, but um, they, they, you know, basically built two, both sides simultaneously and had to fit almost like building an arch, right? And you fit the keystone in at the very top 
Um, but the, you know, there was no centering to put in here. Uh, so it had to be self-supporting as they went. Um, and when they got to the top, the two sides had to be level within, you know, less than an inch or it wouldn't have fit together properly. And, and sure enough, it worked out. So it was quite a construction feat uh, as well as a design feat. And if you've been to St. Louis, you know, of course, you want to see a great baseball team like the Cardinals. Uh, but uh, when they're not playing, um, you can go up in the arch um, on the really cool elevator or that, you know, is more like a little tube that rotates as you go up and up and up. And uh, you get to the top and you get some cool views of St. Louis. Notice I put in a little dig on the uh, Chicago baseball team since I, you know, grew up around Edwardsville uh, near St. Louis. All right, so uh, one of his most important commissions uh, was the General Motors Technical Center in Warren, Michigan. Uh, this was between 1948 and 1956. Um, you know, living, you know, basically growing up in Michigan in Bloomfield Hills and, you know, the auto industry is all around him. Um, he, Arrow, was, um, you know, I guess had an in to General Motors and when they were looking to create a a sort of headquarters building, uh, you know, in a modernist style or modern architecture for it, um, he was able to win that commission. And this this really helped put him on the map. You know, the, the arch was great and, and he got some attention, but this was, you know, this was constructed in his lifetime and was a big deal. Big corporate client, um, you know, gave him a lot of work and made him very, very famous. And this is a cool um, graphic that General Motors put out um, that really, I think, sums up the, the attitude in this post-war era of, you know, the future, you know, modern cars, you know, modern architecture, modern way of living, everything, but the attitudes after the end of two radically shifted. I mean, if you really think about it, um, you know, we were coming out of a over a decade of a depression, you know, the, the stock market crashed in 1929. And, you know, there were, there were little mini recoveries, but really the, the country never fully emerged out of the depression um, before World War II started for the U.S. in 1941. And then, you know, then you have the war years uh, and nothing can be built uh, other than war production during World War II. Um, and so, you know, between 1929 and 1945, and actually it really almost the full 1940s, because, you know, there were building, there were material shortages, there was, you know, factories had been, you know, all in on war production um, during the war. And so it took a couple, three years before a sort of transition back to domestic, you know, regular industry and production and commercial Things. So really, it's the late 1940s before we really start to see major architecture being built again. That's that's over 15 years. This is a long time. And so, um, you know, Americans were really hungry for something new. They they you know the depression was a you know not a good memory time for them. The war was definitely not a good memory time. We won the war, and that you know made people happy. But I mean, you know, it was horrific. And so people just wanted to think about a, a new world, a new era, and modern architects stepped up and said, hey, we can provide that. And, you know, we have this period of the late 40s, 1950s, into the 1960s when um, this sort of modernist architecture is seen as a new way to live and a way to restructure uh, society and culture. So here is an aerial view of the complex. Of course, it's been added on to over time as well, but you see some of uh, the, the massive suburban complex. This is another thing that emerges out of the post-World War II America, and that is the, and it's not coincidental that it's, you know, Detroit automakers that do this. It's the, it's the predominance of the automobile. Um, and so we begin to see the suburban office developments that are accessible by car. And you see a lot of big parking lots, right? And so while cities like Chicago, New York, and so forth still thrive, and you know we see architectural hot skyscrapers and all that that we'll talk about, um, a lot of the growth in America happens in suburbia. 
exurban development uh, that is completely auto dependent here, um, like we see here. And so we see, you know, a complex of buildings, these skyscrapers, because land is cheap out here in the suburbs, uh, and it's sprawled out. We get these big reflecting pools and water retention ponds and so forth um, with a lot of green space. You know, wait, you know, many would argue it's it's kind of wasted space because um, it, it might be a bucolic setting to look out your window, but um, you can only do it by, you can only have this sort of thing by, you know, massive use of the automobile, which of course General Motors was very eager for. Um, here's another view of that. We can see the full extent of the ponds here, um, some of the some of the architecture that he designed, including this dome shape. I'll show you that in a moment. That's a, that's a sort of an exhibition hall for new cars. Here's a historic view, again, showing one of those fancy new cars that General Motors, I think that's a Cadillac uh, that General Motors would be making, uh, you know, in contrast to this really stark modernist steel and glass architecture. Um, Aero Saarinen really embraces the Miesian um, aesthetic, and I, I haven't come back to Mises' architecture yet in this post-war era, so I'm bouncing around a little bit, but this is very much a Miesian style of steel, exposed steel, lots of glass, um, a little bit of pillow tees. These are, these are ramps that connect the different wings of the building because it is Michigan and it, they do have winter and they get snow in April like we do. Um, so, you know, just like the Triton campus, right, where you can go between the different buildings uh, with those um, sky bridges, um, he does the same thing here at the General Motors complex. Here's one of the buildings. Um, uh, very much in the Bauhaus tradition, you know, rectangular massing. Um, the building essentially does sit up on pilotis, flat roofs, you know, more or less ribbon windows, freeform facades. This is very much a Corbusian Bauhaus style of architecture here, um, using steel, which is abundant in America, um, versus some other countries where you know, steel manufacturing is not as um, cheap and efficient. So uh, we tend to see a lot more steel construction in America than in other places. Here's the lobby of one of the buildings. And of course, it's big enough to put in a you know, fancy car. That really is sort of a futuristic uh, looking uh, automobile there. But uh, we see more exposed brick. We see the grid of uh, the ceiling system that has incorporates, you know, a lighting into that. Uh, we see this sort of open staircase. This is similar to the staircase we saw at the, uh, at the, um, uh, geez, I'm drawing a blank on the architect that uh, I'll think of it later. Anyway, we talked about him last time. I thought this was so cool. I mean, if I showed you this and you didn't see the cars in the background, you might think that this was like from the maybe the seventies or something like that. This is, you know, 1950s or late forties. Um, and even the receptionist is looking pretty stylish in her uh, sunglasses there, but uh, you know, really, really cool artwork behind. And, you know, Aro Saarinen also did a lot of furniture design. He's well known for that. Um, I think I might have an example or two of his furniture I'll show you, but you know, he, he would have designed this reception desk to, you know, fit into this, um, to this lobby space. And here's a view of that domed exhibition hall. And they would use, General Motors would use this to showcase their newest automobiles. And so they could, you know, here they're, they're shown, the cars are shown outside uh, with the lovely models showing off these fancy rocket-like cars. Um, but um, this one really is rocket-like down here in the row, right? Uh, and then you get the more traditional ones off in the background. But um, they could put the cars inside this dome. They could do photo shoots. They could have the press come and, or, or you know, uh, car buyers and things like that. Not this, not like a car showroom where you go and buy your car, but rather for marketing and PR purposes that they built this. 
so here's a view of that on the interior um, showing one of their fancy new station wagons, you know, and this, you know, really cool lighting and, you know, a space devoid of any distractions, you know, the modernist aesthetic works great because the cars should be the highlight um, uh, in this space here. I also like the no smoking sign. There's a, you know, sign of the times, right? Uh, hardly need those anymore. All right, another great work um, that is um, groundbreaking in its use of materials is the John Deere and Company campus in Moline, Illinois, the Quad Cities, uh, designed 1957, finished in 1963 after his death. And this is another example of essentially a suburban office development, just like the uh, General Motors um, example we were seeing. So here again, we see the reflecting pool and you know a pavilion building set in this bucolic landscape drive out on any of the expressways and tollways and you get far enough far enough out of the older part of the chicagoland suburbs and you start to see these kinds of office developments you head west on 88 towards naperville and this is all you start to see right and again a very much a modernist aesthetic uh steel and glass um building pretty much flaps rectangular massing. Here's an aerial view of the campus um, soon after it was built. So here's the big highway uh, that you need to get access to it and then you get off on the side road and then you go down the drive and giant parking lots uh, which you need. Uh, here's the giant reflecting pool or, or retention pond because um, you know you're, you're covering a lot of landscape with paving for the parking lots. Uh, and so all that water runoff needs to go into the retention basin and they make it a decorative feature. The landscape architects will create a, uh, a beautiful pond out of it or something rather than just a you know, pool of water. But um, this really represents the sort of planning process that occurs in much of the growth of America in the post-war period. Here's another one of those sky bridges. This connects the different pavilions or wings of the complex. Um, again, Moline, they're getting snow today too, I'm sure. So, um, you know, this allows people to walk from one to another. Lots of steel and glass, as you can see. And you can see he does incorporate these louvers, and you can see that pretty well in this elevation here. Uh, these sun louvers, it's kind of an early form of sustainable architecture. You got to really um, give Saarinen some credit here. Uh, Glass buildings, right, <laughs> have a lot of sun load on them and they can heat up. Now, you know, at, in the mid to late 20th century, architects just said, well, you know, we'll just pump the buildings full of air conditioning in summer and, and heat them up in the winter and it's cheap. Um, now we know the not, not only the environmental effects of, of all that, but also, you know, the cost has gone way up uh, to heat and cool buildings. And so, um, even in that era, he already had the idea of we really ought to provide some sun shading with these louver screens. You can still see out, you still get light in, but it isn't that direct harsh sunlight that really heats up, you know, people sitting along the edges of the building there. Here you can see that in a little more detail, uh, as well as that sky bridge coming across. So uh, the John Deere facility is famous um, for a innovative new um, product. I don't, I don't know that this is the first time it's ever used. It was, it was kind of an industrial uh, product, um, but um, Saarinen essentially uses it here as an architectural uh, material that is exposed and expressed, and that's Corten steel. Uh, Corten steel was developed by um, um, one of the steel companies, and the idea behind it is, you know, steel rust, right? If you don't protect it, if you don't paint it or coat it in some way, steel will rust if it's exposed to environment, if it's exposed to moisture. And as it rusts, it disintegrates. And that's not a good thing. Uh, and so what the idea behind Corten steel is that uh, it, it is chemically designed to, um, to have a surface rust that then protects the, the rest of the steel underneath. Um, so it's almost like painting it, right? You, you would normally paint or coat uh, the steel to protect the inside part of the steel from rusting. Uh, the 
the surface rusting that we see here with Corten steel is that surface protection. It sort of oxidizes and then it then it protects the rest of the steel and it will not rust away, not easily at least. Um, and so it can be left unfinished, you know, and you just see the rusted steel. Uh, and it's a really um, innovative product because, you know, it's expensive to paint steel and then repaint it and then repaint it, you know, constantly, just the way you have to do with, you know, wood cladding or something like that. And so this was a uh, a great way to create a steel building, you know, for these architects like Saarinen and Mies and so forth, who really liked the steel, exposed steel aesthetic of a steel and glass building, but the clients didn't like the idea of the maintenance long term. Uh, this was a really innovative product. And we'll see that quite a bit. If you go around even in the loop uh, around Chicago and elsewhere, you'll see a lot of Corten steel. Here's the lobby, uh, sort of one of the big lobby spaces. And again, you can visit, uh, I've actually never gotten to go here, but you can visit uh, the headquarters here and you can you know, get a tour of the main lobby and sit in the big combines and tractors and stuff uh, uh, if you want to pretend like you're uh, driving one of those things. All right, so those were two examples of uh, the Mesian influence to uh, to Saarinen. But Saarinen was really creative and innovative, and he also um, really can be considered a more expressive architect, um, in which he believed that the building forms could be, could express something about the architecture. And when it comes to an airport terminal, this was a great opportunity, and I'm going to show you the TWA terminal at JFK Airport in New York. From started in 1956, been in 62, and you know if we go back to the lecture we had on on the Industrial Revolution, one of the main new innovations of the mid century was the train, the railroad, right? And a new architectural expression had to be created to have a terminal for these trains where people could come and go. Well, a hundred years later, the same thing, but for airplanes. Um, and what, how does, how does architecture um, express the idea of traveling by flight, by air? And Saarinen is really the first architect to say, you know, our airports ought not to just be a box. Um, they ought to express the idea of flight. And his TWA terminal is still considered to be a just a masterpiece of expressionist architecture that, that really says something about the fact that this is where you go to fly in the air, right? Um, this isn't just a box that looks like it could be an office building or anything else. This is distinctly meant to be Air, for airplanes and uh, for the idea of flight. And it, it is meant to evoke the idea of a bird taking flight, its wings spreading out and beginning to rise up. It's meant to look light, like it could almost lift up off the ground. And um, this, is, this is a really, really innovative architecture um, at this time in the mid 20th century. And it really breaks from the more you know, international style that we had talked about, the Bauhaus and Mies and all of that, um, and is picked up by a lot of architects after him. I mean, he's a really um, inspirational architect, Saarinen, because of, of, especially because of this work um, uh, at TWA and later at Dulles Airport. Here's that historic view I showed you at the title slide. Um, again, with the uh, with the old cars there, and I think you can see it even better here, where it looks like it's a bird about to take off. It's got the little, little tiny feet that's landed on the ground. Here's a little head and a beak almost, uh, and the wings are spreading out. And he's using the technologies of concrete construction, and um, you know, it, advancing 
technologies or, or, or scientific abilities to understand loading and forms and how one could create these forms and shapes, even well before the advent of, of computers that can, you know, generate, you know, in CAD, uh, these kinds of forms and shapes, we're at least getting to the point where there are giant, you know, almost computers that fill up entire rooms and they can process, you know, the, the more difficult calculations engineers needed to do. Um, which nowadays, you just pull out your phone and your calculator on that is as powerful, is more powerful probably than the calculator uh, that filled up a, a computer that filled an entire room in the 1950s, but it allowed them to do this kind of engineering. And then the rest of it, this is just a big concrete shell and the rest of it is glass, you know, uh, you know, and it's, you know, it looks like it might be holding up the building, but it's not, right? The, the, structure is entirely the concrete forms and the glass is just a way to enclose the space and to you know separate the outside and the inside uh, and here's the floor plan so even the floor plan is not you know rectangular at all uh, and um, down at the bottom is the um, drive where you do the pickups and drop-offs and you'd walk in to the main uh, lobby space on either side here to the left and right or well on one side is the ticketing counter on the other side is the baggage uh, claim area um, you know this is this is the late 50s this was a tiny terminal right um, it's only for TWA airline which doesn't even exist anymore um, and um, you know there were other terminals at JFK but you know people didn't fly much back then this was um, this was meant to be um, something that wasn't as big, and we and there was no security back then. Um, in when this opened, you got out of the taxi, you walked in, you got your ticket, and you just walked up this little flight of stairs to your waiting room right here. And um, you had a great vista to the tarmac; you could see the planes out there. And then when they called your flight, you just walked down the sky bridge and and walked on your plane. And uh, it was nothing like TSA. You didn't have to strip down. You didn't have to unpack your entire bag to have it searched. You know, it was, it was really simple back then, but nobody had figured out that you could blow up planes or crash them into buildings yet. So here are some historic views um, uh, of the terminal before it opened, so there's no people yet. Um, and you can see that the interior is completely, you know, molded and expressive the way the exterior is. So this is a, um, a a complete architectural tradition. It isn't like, hey, he created this really cool exterior, and then you go inside and it's just ordinary and plain. You know, it's just boxy rooms and stuff like that. Um, everything is reflective of the space, and he really got creative in here. So this is that. Uh, main entryway, so you would walk in. There's the ticketing area off, uh, in the background, and here's the big display board showing you the different flights uh, coming and arriving. Um, <laughs> not too many here, um, and uh, there's even one for Chicago there. Uh, and there's a little, you know, little counter information. You know, oh, where do I go to pick up my flight? How do I do this? A lot of people would have been flying for the first time, um, you know, and and this would have been an experience for them. Um, so, and this is this is designed by Saarinen, you know, in his traditional forms that he was uh, creative with. And then once you had your ticket, again, over here on the right, and you found out, you know, if your flight was delayed, you'd walk up this little flight of steps into the lounge area, which is over on the left. And you can see the, the huge wall of windows to allow you to sit and relax and enjoy a, a view of the tarmac while you're waiting for your flight. And there's even balconies and things that you could walk around. There would be restaurants and terminals, you know, nowadays you go to the restaurant because you're stuck in the terminal and you need something to eat before your flight. People would literally go to airplane terminals and eat in the restaurant just for the experience. And they could watch the planes and they could see the takeoffs and landings. And again, you didn't need a ticket. You didn't have to go through security. And it was just an experience. You'd go with your family and go to the fancy restaurant at the, uh, at the airport terminal. So here's the view um, of the lounge area. Uh, it's recessed. It's got, you know, molded forms and shapes uh, to kind of sit back and relax comfortably. Uh, and you would look out to the left there, out to the terminal uh, tarmac. Uh, here's a view uh, out on the tarmac of 
of one of those fancy new jet planes and there's the uh the you know off in the distance is the terminal and you can really see how it even from this view it looks like a bird about to take flight there So let's pause here. Um, if you go into uh, your Blackboard under um, course materials, there's a link to uh, it's titled TWA Terminal. It's just a silent movie. I think it lasts about two minutes. And it's some, somebody took a, this little home movie, in, I think it was about 1972, so very shortly after it opened. And just watch that real quick to kind of get a, a sense of what uh, it would have been like to experience not just this terminal, but really, you know, what it would have been like to experience a, an airline terminal uh, well before 9-11, well before terrorism, you know, made it not very much fun experience anymore. So we'll take a short break here and uh, come back here in a moment. 